Welcome to everybody who has joined this Fundamentals of Global Finance and Accounting webinar, and thank you all for doing so. Let me first introduce myself. My name is Lavina Advani, and I'm the Digital Marketing Manager here at Imperial's Executive Education Division. I'm joined here by Claudia Custodio, Professor of Finance at Imperial College Business School, and Franklin Allen, Executive Director of the Brevin Howard Center and Professor of Finance and Economics. In the course of the next 30 to 40 minutes, Claudia and Franklin are going to help you understand the basics of finance and accounting, and are going to do that by focusing on corporate finance. They will give you some really practical advice on how to make sound business decisions. They will also talk about Airbus's case study, which has been in the news a lot recently with their decision to stop producing the A380. Feel free to ask any questions throughout the webinar using the questions box. Claudia and Franklin will try and answer all of them at the end of the webinar. I'm now going to hand over to Franklin who will introduce himself. Good afternoon. This is Franklin Allen. I'm a professor of finance and economics here at Imperial College. I've been here for about five years. Before that, I was at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania for many, many years. I was able to take early retirement and take up this very interesting position at the Imperial College Business School. The course that we're going to give is one that's a basic finance course, but it's a very important one. It's designed for people who are not uh, finance specialists. And we've, we've done this before uh, a, a number of times now, and we're looking forward to seeing you in a few day's time uh, on the, the 11th to the 15th of March, if you're able to come. Let me hand over now to my colleague, Claudia Custodio. Thank you, Franklin. Um, hello, my name is Claudia Custodio, and I'm an associate professor of finance here at Imperial College. Um, I joined uh, about three years ago from, from Lisbon, and um, before that, I used to be in Arizona at um, Arizona State University, where I was an assistant professor of finance. Um, I graduated a few years ago from, from the London School of Economics, and I mostly um, work in the in corporate finance area. So I've, I've been doing research in in empirical corporate finance, studying questions such as uh, executive education, ex uh, sorry, <laughs> executive compensation, um, also actually executive education as well, the role of, of, um, of financial literacy and financial expertise uh, for firm value and, uh, and decision making. And um, I'm going to, to together with, with Franklin, I'm going to be teaching this course in the foundations of, of finance. So let me try to motivate what, why it is important to study um, corporate finance. So corporate finance is mostly about uh, two decisions that are very important decisions that companies have to make. The first decision is about uh, investment decisions. So basically, what are the long-term investments in fixed assets that the companies should do? And the second decision is about finance, financing decision. And this is basically understanding how the company should raise funds in order to finance the selected investments. Um, while making investment decisions, there are two key concepts that uh, we should understand. Um, and the first one is, is to understand 
um, the cash flows that the investments produce and how we can evaluate them and and add them together because we are talking about cash flows that can occur now or down in the future. So a key um, concept in, in corporate finance is the time value of money and basically um, how we can we can add up these cash flows, the cash flows that occur today versus the ones that, that will occur in the future. And, and the second key aspect in investment decisions has to do with, with the cost of capital of such investments. So basically, investors are going to demand a different return, whether they are investing in very um, safe type of investments and they, when they are investing in more risky investments. And this will have an impact on the way we evaluate those, those decisions. So once the investment decision is made and we understand the cash flows and the cost of capital for those decisions, companies will have to figure out how they are going to finance those investments. And this is basically to understand whether they should go with equity investment or with that investment. Basically, what's the mix of the two types of securities that the company should hold. But also within that, for instance, if they should go with bank loans or with bond financing and whether this should be short term financing or long term financing. So a lot of decisions to make when when it comes to to financing those those investments. I like to use um, the balance sheet, which is um, a financial statement that basically all the companies have to produce, I like to use the balance sheet as an analogy to these two questions. So basically, on the left-hand side of the balance sheet, companies report their assets, and these assets can be short-term assets, so basically the current assets, and long-term assets, which we call the fixed assets, for instance, the machines or the buildings that the companies might have. And then on the right hand side of the balance sheet, we can think um, about this right hand side as the total value of the firm to the investors that have contributed with funds to finance the, the assets. So basically, we're going to have short term liabilities, the ones that are due in less than one year from now long-term liabilities, including long-term debt, and also shareholders' equity. So basically the funds that shareholders have contributed to the company and also the ones that the company is able to, to generate and, and return and retain in, in the company. Um, if we rearrange this balance sheet um, by Picking the short-term liabilities, and I'm going to do a little bit of math here, and so I'm going to pick the short-term liabilities that were just on the right-hand side of the balance sheet, and I'm just going to pass them to the left-hand side with, with a minus sign. I'm going to have now on the left-hand side of the balance sheet what we are going to call the invested capital, and this is basically networking capital, which is defined as the current assets that I had in my left-hand side minus the current liabilities that I just went to get from the right-hand side um, together with my fixed assets. So basically the long-term assets that the company has invested on. So together on the left-hand side of the balance sheet, now what I have is the total amount that the company has invested. So basically long-term investment, the fixed assets, and short-term invest investment, the net working capital. And on the right-hand side, I'm going to be left with my long-term financing. So basically long-term debt and shareholders' equity. And now um, I have a perfect match between the left-hand side 
of my rearranged balance sheet, so basically invested capital, which maps directly to the investment decision that the company has to make. So basically what are the investments that the company should choose in order to <coughs> maximize its value. And on the right hand side, I'm going to have a direct map between the financing decision, the second most important decision the company has to make, and the right hand side of the balance sheet. So basically the mix between debt and equity. So the right hand side of my balance sheet is going to give answer to the question, how should companies um, should raise funds in order to finance the selected investments. So to wrap up, we can think about the company as a pie and here's my pie. And the role of the manager is going to be increasing the size of the pie by doing what? <coughs> by making the right investment decisions, the first type of decisions. And the capital structure decision, the financing decision, can be thought of as uh, the best way of slicing the pie. So whether we should finance the company, for instance, with 50% debt and 50% equity, or whether I should go just with 15-5% debt and 75% equity. or 70% debt and 30% equity. So again, um, basically the idea that we maximize firm value by making the right investment decisions and complement this, this decision with um, the right capital structure decision, basically the decision to, fi to finance those uh, investments. Obviously, the company is not alone, and these decisions are not taken, taken isolatedly. The company operates in a broader context. We can think about this context as the context of financial markets. Um, so, whenever we are talking about financial decisions, so these financial decisions um, <coughs> Um, these financial decisions, they involve issuing securities, basically, for instance, equity, uh, equity securities or debt securities that are going to be traded in financial markets. So by investing in such securities, um, investors can, can provide companies with the funds that then the company can use to finance the, the investments. These investors obviously expect to receive uh, some return in exchange for these um, for this funding and it's the role of the company to uh, make uh, good investment decisions, generate cash flow and return it to financial markets. Um, in alternative to return it to financial markets, the company can also make the decision to retain those funds in the company itself and reinvest in the business. So we are also going to discuss this trade-off between reinvesting generated um, cash that is generated in the company versus returning it to uh, back to, to investors. Um, so one of, of, of one interesting case that we are going to cover and that has been recently on the news is the Airbus case, which is actually in, in very basic terms, an investment decision that um, Airbus had to make a few, a few years ago. This has been recently on, on the news and I will hand it over to Franklin so he can comment on, on this. Thank you, Claudia, for that very clear exposition of the framework that we're going to develop as we go through the course. What we're going to do, though, is to use that framework to think about these investment and financing decisions 
And we're going to use several real-world examples of that. Now, as Claudia indicated, one of the cases that we're going to talk about is what's called the AAAX case. And at the time, they didn't have the name for it, but that subsequently turned out to be the A380. And it's a very interesting case, and it illustrates some of the benefits of, of using this framework that Claudia has just uh, laid out in its bare bones. Now, if you go back to the turn of the century, Airbus and Boeing were great competitors. And in most segments, they each had a plane which they could produce and sell to the airlines. Now, the area where that wasn't true was in terms of jumbo jets. Boeing had developed the 747 many, many years ago. So it went into service first in the late 60s, and it had been around for, at that time, around 30 years or so. Now, they dominated that market. It was a very profitable market for Boeing. They were able to use the profits from it to cross-subsidize research and development in their other planes and so forth. And so Airbus came up with the idea of developing a competitor. And what we'll do in the Airbus case is to look at the situation as it then was and consider, was it a good commercial decision to develop the A380? Now, you can argue it both ways, and we'll obviously look at both sides of the argument. What we've seen now, though, is that we've, we've got some kind of outcome, though. Airbus has decided to stop producing the A380 in two years' time, in 2021. In the end, it hasn't produced that, or it won't have produced that many aircraft. And we'll see whether that was predictable or not at, at the time. The big debate at, at the turn of the century was, was the future going to be in hub and spoke systems, so the big airports like London's Heathrow or Tokyo and Tokyo's Narita, Frankfurt, and so on, the, the big airline hubs, or was it going to be point to point? Was it going to be that people would fly from smaller airports, which weren't huge, but were sizable, like Philadelphia in the US, and uh, Osaka in Japan, those kinds of airports, or were we going to see this hub and spoke system with the big major ones? You use large planes and then small planes to go to the smaller airports. Boeing at the time made its bet on the 787, and that's been commercially very successful. So the question is, given what we knew at the turn of the century, was Airbus's decision a good one? Was Boeing's decision a good one? As you'll see, we'll use some very simple tools that we'll develop. This is case comes in at the start of the program rather than, than the end. But even with these basic tools, you can see the nature of the decision that was being made. And you can come to your own conclusion about whether this was a good thing for Airbus to do. Now let me talk a little bit about some of the general points. It, it's fine to have theories about finance and accounting and how people should make decisions. But what's really important, having developed that framework, is to understand execution. And we will be spending a lot of time in the cases talking about how you use these tools to actually execute decisions. And as this quotation from Peter Drucker, who's a famous management guru that many of you may have heard of, vision without execution is delusion and the joy is in the results. So we will be focusing on this notion of how do you actually take these ideas that we'll develop and 
execute them to produce good results. Now, we will be talking a lot about basic accounting and basic finance and developing the tools that these two disciplines have developed over the years. Our, our basic notion will be one of uh, value and in particular shareholder value, but of course in today's world that's not all that we're interested in. We're also interested in stakeholders and stakeholders have a very wide variety of forms. So today uh, the environment obviously is extremely important to firms' actions and we'll be uh, thinking about the role that we all have as stakeholders in the environment. We'll also talk about the workers, the other security holders like the debt holders, the government, taxpayers, and so on, a whole variety of different ways of thinking about the, the company. But as is common in much of the, the world, particularly in the Anglo-Saxon world, we'll be thinking about shareholder value as being the prime indicator of how corporations should act. So what are some of the learning objectives that we'll be developing? Well, we'll start out with looking at evaluating the financial performance of a business by looking at its three most important financial statements. Those are its balance sheet, its income statement, and its cash flow statement. And then we'll look at how you can use this financial information that's contained in the accounting statements to find problems that management will need to fix going forward. So what are the early warning indicators and how can they identify them from these accounting and financial statements? Then we'll look at some of the most important metrics to tie the link between the execution of a strategy and how that affects the financial health of the business. We'll talk about a lot about discounted cash flow. So in other words, net present value, as many of you may have heard about it, and how we can use that to look at value creation possibilities for strategy. I just talked about the Airbus case, and that's a very good example of using these strategies to see can they create value. We'll spend some time looking at the nuts and bolts of valuing a business, because if you're trying to create value, you need to know where value comes from. As Claudia mentioned, we'll also be talking about optimal financial strategies. Should we use debt or equity? What are the advantages and disadvantages of those? What are the other kinds of things that we can use to finance companies? Clearly, risk is at the heart of any kind of financial decision. And we'll be spending some time looking at how we think about risk in investment decisions and in terms of measuring the performance of business units. We'll learn ultimately how financial outcomes result from the formulation and execution of strategy and how we can go about effective execution of those strategies. Who should come to the program? This is very much a program for mid-level managers who haven't had much experience of finance. So most of the people on the course will be non-finance executives. Often we get people who have just moved to finance roles and need to have more ex extensive understanding of the financial background that they'll now be working in. So what are the benefits to you and your organization? I think it's fairly clear that in today's business world, an understanding of financial and accounting issues is key for career progression in many, many sectors. 
what we're trying to do in this program is to give a basic background to the managers who haven't had much, if any, formal financial education. So the aim will be to give a key understanding of the fundamentals of both finance and accounting. And we're going to talk about global business. So we won't just focus on the UK. We'll be talking about Europe, US, uh, Asia, many different countries. And what we're trying to do is to make sure that participants will leave the program equipped to understand and critically analyze finance. And those are designed to underpin a sound strategy for the business that you're dealing with. Why is our program unique? Well, it's going to be located an Imperial College Business School on Imperial College's campus. And that gives us access to a unique set of resources and intellectual assets and networks. Imperial College is rather different than, than most universities in the UK in the sense that we have a very strong focus on STEM subjects. So science, technology, engineering, and medicine. We're often called the MIT of Europe because of this strong focus on STEM subjects. We don't have the humanities and many of the, the other social sciences and many of the other subjects that you find in most universities, but we do have a business school. And what we're trying to do is to fuse business and technology, and that's the DNA of Imperial College Business School. One of the things we have as our founding principles is the notion of an impact lab philosophy. What we're going to try and do is take our resources in the rest of the college and deliver a cross-disciplinary experience to you. Now, one example of that is the carbon capture lab. So clearly one of the most important issues facing the world today is climate change and how to reduce the carbon that's emitted into the atmosphere without causing huge economic disruption. Now, one of the things that we have on campus is a pilot scale carbon capture lab. And what this does is to take carbon dioxide from emissions and then uh, it can be either be stored or dealt with, used by industry in some other way. We'll be taking you through that carbon capture lab and explaining how it works, what the technical aspects of it are, but we'll also be considering a case to show how the market for carbon emissions can be used to make this an attractive alternative for firms that are or developing energy which still uses the old technologies of oil, coal, and so forth. And this gives an, a good example of how we go across and use the resources of the University of Imperial College. Here is the overview. I won't spend a great deal of time going through this, but basically on the first day, Claudia will talk about accounting statements, that the financial information that we, we've talked about briefly in, in this webinar. And she'll talk about measures of business performance and then uh, develop one of the most famous ones, which is uh, the basis of strategy, which is the DuPont system. On the Tuesday, I will start introducing discounted cash flow techniques and we'll spend the morning on that. So how do we think about discounted cash flow? Where does it come from? What, what, what is the discount rate that we're going to use? Why is that a sensible way of proceeding? And then we'll talk a little bit about how we can use it to develop strategies, to think about whether strategies are sensible or not 
and that will take, as I say, the whole morning. In the afternoon, Claudia will talk about the Airbus case, which we, we've just talked about at, at some length, and that'll be the whole afternoon. On the Wednesday morning, I'll develop some more detailed uh, frameworks for thinking about capital structure. We'll, we'll start talking about something called a Medigliani Miller, which is um, a framework which is an ideal world, but then we'll go on and look at what happens as we introduce more and more features of the real world that companies actually face. In the afternoon, we'll talk a little bit about the global financial situation that faces companies today. Obviously, we'll talk about Brexit, since in the UK, that's what we seem to spend an enormous amount of time focused on at the moment. Hopefully, that will soon be past us, and we will have some certainty about the world uh, that we live in, in terms of business uh, in, in the UK. But that's only one part of what's going on in the world, of course. There are many other things going on. We've got the uh, the trade war between uh, China and the US, that's obviously extremely important. Uh, there was a report in the German press today, to give another example, that the uh, US is going to come out with a report shortly that European uh, cars are a threat to the US national security. It's an interesting leap as to how one goes from people making BMWs and Mercedes in Germany and uh, Jaguars and Land Rovers in the UK to it causing a national security problem in the US, but it seems they're about to do that. It's really all about politics, of course, because it's a way of introducing tariffs and it will further project uh, President Trump's uh, policies of trying to improve America's standing in terms of, of trade and so on. So we'll talk about some of those things and many of the other things that are going on in, in the world uh, global financial system at the moment. At the end of the day, we'll give you a chance to talk about um, the Diageo case, which is an interesting case, which we'll talk about in more depth on the uh, on the ne next day. And then we'll go to the carbon capture lob, which I just briefly talked about. And then we'll have a chance to socialize at the Gore Hotel with um, some drinks at the end of the day. Hopefully this will be a good chance for you to network with the other participants. You'll get to meet them through the case studies and so on, but this will be a more social occasion than we will have uh, during the day. The next day on the Thursday, we will talk about a bit more about the uh, case for the Carbon Capture Lab. And then we'll go on to talk about mergers and acquisitions and look at, a, a, at the case of uh, Geely's acquisition of Volvo and how that worked and how that's an example of valuation. In the afternoon, Claudia will talk about Diageo and um, go through that case. And then they'll have a chance to uh, talk about the USX case in the afternoon. You'll have a discussion of it, and Clute Cloudy will lead that. On the Friday, we'll bring together the different strands. Cloudy will talk about value creation in the morning and how uh, we can go from taking these ideas in finance and accounting to actually execute them and go through a number of examples. And then in the afternoon, I'll talk about the example of Emerson Electric, which is a fascinating a case of a very successful US firm, Emerson Electric, how they were able to keep manufacturing as their focus, despite the fact that they have a very large part of their operations in the US. And we'll see how they did it, and we'll argue that it was basically a very good application of the execution and strategic ideas that will develop in the case. And then finally, we'll end up with a 
program wrap up and answer any questions that you might have of an overall nature. And then the program will close around 3.30 in the afternoon and Friday to give you all a chance to get back to your homes, hopefully, on the evening of Friday. Here are the details of it, and I won't go through them in detail, but uh, where it's going to occur and so forth. And if you have any questions, you can always email us. But if you have questions about what we've just talked about, then please send them in now and we're happy to try and answer them. So here's one of the questions that has comes up, which is what kind of pre-work is necessary to take the course? Well, as you've heard, as we've gone through the outline, we have a number of cases and it's very good if you use the time before the course to read the cases. And we can't stress that enough because once you get there, it's going to be quite intense. So please do try and read the cases beforehand. We'll also send some readings and it would be good in those, if you can read those as well. So here's a, a question that just came in from Sunil Gupta. Will there be any other webinar sessions? And I'll hand over to Lavina to answer that question. Um, we might potentially have another webinar session, um, but it hasn't been confirmed yet. Watch out in our webinar section on the events page of our uh, website, Executive Education, to find out more about that one. If you have any questions, those please do do not hesitate to email us. If you just Google Franklin Allen or Claudio Custodio, our websites at Imperial College will come up and you will find our email addresses there. So as I say, please feel free to, to uh, email us. Another question is, will we have some pre-reading to do? Yes, we sort of covered that, the cases, but there will be, as I mentioned, other ones to do. Will there be group work? Yes, there will be group work. You'll have a chance to uh, join groups. We'll change the groups through the week so that you'll get to know as many people as possible working on the cases. So one of the questions that came in, can you, we elaborate a bit more on the carbon capture visit, plant visit exercise? I, I went through that, but basically uh, we will go over, we will see the carbon capture lab. This is one that our chemical engineering students are trained on, that uh, is an actual uh, model of, of real life uh, labs, of, or facilities of this kind, and we'll have a presentation uh, from Colin, who is a, an excellent uh, person, and will explain the technical details. We'll then go through a case the next day explaining how the price of carbon is absolutely critical for determining whether or not we use these kinds of carbon capture technologies to allow fossil fuels to be used without damaging our climate goals, for example, in the Paris Agreement. So it will be a very much a blend of technology and finance and how that can help us with making decisions about adopting climate change technologies. Great. Thank you so much for all the questions and for all the insights there, Claudia and Franklin. That's all the time we have. If you want to contact us with any further questions um, or if we can be of any assistance, 
please feel free to reach out. You can contact myself. Um, my email address is on screen. Um, any questions with regards to the particular training course of Foundations of Finance, please feel free to reach out to my colleague, Jose, whose email address details are on the screen at the moment. And um, lastly, I'd like to thank everyone who has been involved in this webinar and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thanks for tuning in.